Here's a story about saving a girl from the blog of Renee Back, an American missionary in Uganda attempting to save a child. Quote, I hooked the baby up to oxygen and got to work. As I took her temperature, started an IV, checked her blood sugar, tested for malaria, and looked at her HB count, I was attempting to diagnose the many problems that could potentially be at hand. After doing a search for blood around Gingertown, we found her type and it was a match. We started the transfusion. The only problem is the fact that Renee Bach is not a doctor. Renee Bach isn't even a nurse. Renee Bach has no actual medical training whatsoever. She's self-taught, and her missionary center, serving his children, known locally as SHC, has been accused of being responsible for the demise of hundreds of kids. Bach often wore a lab coat and stethoscope, was known to offer diagnosis, administer IVs, and write prescriptions. A volunteer claimed to be driving 7 to 10 children who had passed away back to their families each week. Before all of the trouble with SHC and the lawsuits, Renee Bach was an average Christian teenager who lived in a small town in Virginia. She'd planned to get married, have five kids, and lead a very simple life. However, after she got her high school diploma, members of her church told her that an orphanage in Jinja, Uganda needed volunteers. Bach took the opportunity and volunteered in Uganda for nine months. She immediately fell in love with the place and said that she felt at peace there. When she returned to America, she had an urging in her spirit to go back to Uganda. According to Bach, it was almost like a supernatural experience, like God was calling her back to Uganda. Bach started a feeding program since so many people are hungry in Africa. She raised money through her church and started a free lunch program. The program was held two days per week, and Bach hired people to sort out the arrangements for cooking and cleaning. By the end of her first year, Bach was feeding thousands of people. Her program was a success, and Bach quickly became popular among the locals. Things were going great, but Renee wasn't completely satisfied. One day, Bach received a call from the local hospital. The hospital had some stable but malnourished kids that needed refeeding, and they believed that SHC could help. So Bach took the kids in and started feeding them. That was when she she discovered exactly how endemic the problem of malnourishment was in Uganda. The free lunch program wasn't just enough, and Bach got the idea to provide more holistic support to the children and their parents. She believed that she could care for malnourished kids, hire nutritionists to educate their parents, and have their parents help out in the community garden as a form of payment. That way, she would be solving a present problem, preventing a future one from reoccurring, and also getting help in terms of labor from parents of sick children. Bach thought it was a brilliant plan, and wrote about it in her blog. The response from locals to Bach's program was tremendous. She soon started getting referrals from hospitals far away. These hospitals realized that Bach had time and resources they didn't have, so they referred cases to her by the dozen. Bach was doing what God had called her to do, at least in her mind. Bach decided to make everything official and name the center Serving His Children, locally referred to as SHC. The center was registered with the Ugandan government and got a certificate that allowed it to carry out its activities in evangelism and providing care. Bach also ramped up hiring. She brought in nurses, nutritionists, and even doctors. But despite hiring medical staff, Bach failed to get SHC a medical license for the first four years. In her defense, she claimed that everyone who came to the center signed a waiver acknowledging that the center was not a hospital. But the forms were in English and many of the people who came to her center were illiterate. But it's just malnutrition, so no big deal, right? It seems like malnutrition should be an easy health problem to solve. Someone is starving, you give them food, they get better. But treating malnourished children isn't merely a matter of providing food. When the body is in a state of severe malnutrition, it starts to consume itself to survive. This means that intracellular enzymes stop functioning properly and so do major organs. When nutrients are introduced 
to the body at that point, there can be a huge shift in electrolytes that could cause a potentially deadly condition called refeeding syndrome. In proper conditions, doctors monitor the electrolyte levels in patients and adjust treatment accordingly while feeding them. But Box Center couldn't afford this level of care, so they just went on providing treatment unworried about the consequences. The work soon got overwhelming for Bach as the number of her patients increased. She couldn't keep proper records and had no help from the hospitals around. At the same time, Bach just couldn't turn away those in need. She'd been called and she was saving lives. It was a recipe for disaster. The volume of work SHC was tasked with required Bach to ask for volunteers and she got them. One of those volunteers was Jacqueline Kramlick, a nurse who volunteered at SHC in 2011. As it happens, Kramlick became a very important character in the drama that befell the SHC in its last days. In the suit against Bach, Kramlick was one of the few volunteers who could provide a direct account. Kramlick was fresh out of nursing school, offered her services, but said Bach didn't seem to want any help. She rebuffed any relevant questions about the medicine she was administering and brushed Kramlick off at every step. Kramlick further claimed she once saw Bach attempt to treat patients who showed symptoms of serious ailments. She said she saw Bach carry out procedures without medical oversight from doctors, things that required significant training. Kramlick further claimed that Bach rarely followed universal precautions and guidelines, such as wearing gloves or washing hands while treating patients. Bach often said that Ugandan doctors had no idea what they were talking about. She felt that she was smarter than them because she had access to online resources. She must have assumed that doctors in Uganda didn't have access to Google, or only their silly medical degrees. Kromlik also claimed that she saw Bach give a child with anemia a bottle of intravenous iron just to see what would happen. In the end, Kromlik decided that she'd seen enough and soon sent in her resignation. In her letter, she wrote that Bach was motivated and committed, but had no medical training and wasn't qualified to administer any treatment. She wrote that it was irresponsible for someone like Bach to be supervising a center like SHC. Finally, she said that she quit because the entire environment was simply too unethical for her to remain. Kromlik moved back to the US in 2015 and might have forgotten the entire issue if she'd not confided in her friend Kelsey Nielsen, an American social worker. Nielsen started the influential media program No White Saviors just three years later. No White Saviors would eventually become the campaign that blew the lid off Bach's entire operation. No White Saviors, or NSW, was an NGO, or non-governmental organization, started by Kelsey Nielsen and a Ugandan social worker. The goal of the NGO was to fight against white missionaries who came to Africa in a bid to help, but ended up making things worse. Or at least that was what this NGO claimed to do. Right off the bat, Bach was NWS's primary target. Nielsen believed that Bach had done a lot of harm and got it in her mind to make sure she paid for it. Nielsen had actually worked as a volunteer in the same town as SHC, so she was familiar with Bach. In fact, in a blog post, she argued that she initially admired Bach and wanted to be like her. At the same time, she said she felt a little envious of Bach's status. However, Nielsen quickly became disillusioned about the quality of care Bach was offering to the children she treated. One kid had passed of a heart attack when he was in care of the center Nielsen worked at. Before coming to Nielsen Center, the child had been severely malnourished. The child was then referred to SHC, where Bach and her staff did all they could to nurse the child back to health. Once the child was healthy again, he was sent on his way. However, he soon became malnourished again. This time, he was sent to Nielsen Center, where he eventually passed of a heart attack. This case bothered Nielsen so much because she believed that Bach was partly at fault. She claimed that assuming SHC had followed up on the case, the child wouldn't have deteriorated. After that case, Nielsen started to look more critically at the patients Bach was dealing with, and what she found horrified her. Nielsen discovered that Bach loved hands-on medical care and wasn't a stranger to treating children. She also claimed that Bach often went to hospitals to get babies so that she could treat them. For her part, Bach said she discovered that a boy that SHC had treated was staying at Nielsen's charity organization. She got in touch with Nielsen and offered to send over the boy's medical records, but Nielsen failed to follow up. As the boy got sicker, he was diagnosed with heart problems. Nielsen started raising money online for him, but Bach got in touch and said SHC would cover the cost of his treatment. Bach said that she met Nielsen in person and handed over the money for treatment. According to Bach, Nielsen was somewhat cold after collecting the money. In the meantime, Nielsen announced that she'd met with a cardiologist and that the boy had been cured. That night, the child passed. Bach claims that since then, Nielsen has blamed her. When they got together to talk the matter out, Nielsen claimed that if the child had never been to SHC, he would still have been alive. For Nielsen, the reason was simple. If SHC had done longer follow-up care, they would have caught that the boy was getting worse. However, Bach claimed that SHC simply didn't have the resources for that sort of long-term follow-up work, and the drive to the boys' house from SHC was about eight hours. To Bach, it was unreasonable to expect
expect that level of follow-up care from SHC. Nielsen, on the other hand, believed it was necessary. She argued that SHC needed to hire more workers and provide longer care. So that's exactly what Bach did. A week later, she hired an extra worker and increased aftercare from three months to six months. But that wasn't enough. While Cromlett claimed that she saw Bach setting IV lines, she eventually conceded that it wasn't anything serious. IV lines were easy to set, and Bach was quite good at doing them. However, she maintained that Bach was still doing some dangerous medical procedures. Cromlett further argued that she didn't realize how bad the situation was at SHC until she left. A nurse over at SHC had told her that Bach performed a major surgery that involves cutting the chest open. This claim, too, was eventually walked back. The nurse Cromlett claims to have heard the story from quickly filed an affidavit in Bach's defense. She claimed that she'd never said anything of that nature to Cromlick. But Cromlick and Nielsen weren't the only ones who had interesting stories to tell about Bach. Samai Jolly K. Banacola worked as an agriculturalist at SHC for around eight years. Samai said that during his time at the center, he discovered that Bach often encouraged mothers to leave hospitals and bring their children to SHC. Samai also said he assumed that Bach was a health worker because he'd seen her regularly wearing a clinical coat and a stethoscope. He also said that he'd seen her treating children daily. In response to Samai's claim, Bach argued that she'd never worn a clinical coat or misrepresented herself as a doctor. She also said that as an agriculturalist, Samai had limited access to the patients and workers at the center, so he could never have heard her encouraging mothers to do anything. Another volunteer, Charles Olweny, said that he'd worked as a gatekeeper at the program for eight years. He said that Bach would often take blood, offer diagnosis, administer IVs, and write prescriptions. He also said he saw a lot of children pass, and that he often had to deliver the kids back to their families himself. But even those claims didn't hold up. According to Bach's records, the center treated over a thousand kids and only about 119 children passed. It would be unlikely for Charles to have delivered 10 kids to their villages every week. Bach also said that Charles was dishonest, and the only reason he testified was because he'd been sacked. Unfortunately for Bach, her defenses couldn't save her when Cromlick eventually decided to report SHC to the Ugandan authorities. The district health officer promptly arrived at the center and shut it down because its operating license was no longer valid. The shutdown was an unmitigated disaster. The district officer only gave SHC four hours to move patients out of the center. This meant that Bach had to move children who were still on oxygen and others who were seriously ill. She complained to the officers that the kids could pass away, and he told her that was none of his business. Eight of those children passed away within three days. Then came the lawsuits. When it rains, it pours, and Bach's forecast was dark and stormy. The Women's Pro Bono Initiative eventually got a whiff of the accusations Bach was dealing with. In time, they found two cases they could use to file a lawsuit against her. The two lawsuits were on behalf of mothers who claimed that their children passed as a result of Bach's negligence. The lawsuit made strong claims about the culpability of Bach and SHC, but those claims also fell apart under scrutiny. The first case was about a young child named Tuali Kefabi. Kafabi passed away at SHC after a few days of receiving treatment. Kafabi's grandmother blamed Bach since she was pretending to be a doctor. But the evidence suggests that Kafabi was seriously ill and SHC had done all it could to help treat him. When he was presented at the center, he was attended to by a doctor four times. Unfortunately, his case deteriorated. Independent experts were given the boy's case file to review and not one of them could point out a misstep by SHC. According to the experts, SHC gave the child proper care, but his case was simply too far gone. Additionally, the sort of care that could have saved the child was probably not available in the area at that time. According to Kafabi's grandmother, she routinely saw Bach trying to treat her grandson. However, at the time the child was admitted, Bach was on her way to the United States and remained there for the duration of his stay. The stamps on her passport proved it. The second story was even more inconclusive. It was about Elijah, the child of Annette Kakia. According to Kakai, her son Elijah had been diagnosed with tuberculosis. An SHC driver had taken her and her son to a hospital where SHC was running a program in partnership with the Ugandan government. At the health center, Kakai was informed that her son couldn't be admitted because they had no isolated wards. However, she was offered some milk for him and given transportation money home. But Elijah didn't get better after drinking the milk and Kakai had to take him to another hospital. He passed away at the hospital three days later. Kakai claimed that her son had received tainted milk from SHC, but that's impossible to prove. It's possible he did receive tainted milk, but it's more likely that to tuberculosis had killed him. In Bach's defense in court, she claimed that Elijah was never even admitted to SHC. She argued that SHC couldn't be held responsible for what happened to a child who was never under their care. 
Despite the very heavy accusations targeted at SHC, Ugandan government officials were convinced that the center was a net positive. Officials of the area, SHC, wrote a letter of recommendation allowing SHC to renew its license. However, the government didn't turn a blind eye to the accusations and lawsuits against SHC. The Ugandan government launched its own inquiry after learning about the lawsuits, and the Uganda Medical and Dental Practitioners Council looked extensively into the matter. The investigators finished their investigations and found no evidence to support the claim that SHC caused the demise of a large number of children. Despite the many accusations coming from locals and volunteers, not everyone disliked Bach and SHC. The head of a local hospital, Abner Tegula, argued that Bach was simply trying to fill a gap that the government couldn't fill. In the end, he said that if he had the offer to work with Bach again, he would take it without a second thought. Another local supporter of Bach is the district health officer of the area, Gideon Wamasep. Aside from being the district health officer, he also worked with Bach to establish a feeding program. According to Gideon, all accusations that Bach treated patients were false. He said that he was the one who often saw patients, and Bach was the one who paid. All she wanted was to get good doctors who could work with her and deliver quality health care to patients. Gideon argued that Bach never had any interest in treating patients, nor did she attempt to. He said that the claim about thousands of kids passing at SHC was simply impossible. There couldn't be that many children in the district passing without causing an uproar. Investigations revealed that all wasn't quite right with Bach's accusers either. One of her biggest accusers, Samay Jolly Quenbankola, the agriculturalist, proved himself to be a self-serving person who just wanted to shake Bach down. In an interview with a journalist, he revealed that one of his primary issues with Bach was that she fired him after he asked for a salary increase. Additionally, he was pushing for an out-of-court settlement with Bach, and it appeared that was all he was in the case for. He just wanted a slice of the money coming into SHC from donors. For doctors, malnutrition in children is one of the trickiest conditions to treat. In many cases, it's probably better to do nothing than to do something and possibly make matters worse. Children suffering from malnutrition are so fragile that something as basic as hydrating the child through an IV could trigger unfavorable reactions. This risk is the reason why Ugandan authorities only approve malnourishment treatment to be undertaken by high-level facilities, not just health centers. So it's possible that SHC may have been making matters worse. While Bach agrees that she might have made some mistakes, she insists that in many cases she had no choice. She often took the malnourished children to hospitals and they would turn her away, saying they didn't have the resources to give proper care. Bach recognized the situation, but she couldn't just hand the kids back to their parents and send them on their way. In her mind, some action was better than no action. Investigations into SHC revealed that the center had a mortality rate that was around 20% at one point. It eventually reduced that number to around 10%. According to experts at UNICEF, fatality rates that high were bad enough to raise certain red flags. In the end, Bach decided to settle the case out of court. SHC gave the two mothers $9,500 each and admitted no guilt in the case. While that may have been the end for that case, it doesn't mean it's the end of legal troubles for Bach. The No White Saviors Advocacy Group that had been set up by Nielsen has promised to get in contact with even more mothers who could sue SHC. This could mean another round of legal battles and settlements for Bach. And who knows what the courts will decide this time. In the meantime, Bach was forced to flee back to the U.S. due to the number of death threats she was receiving. Who are the criminals that come up with the most devious plans? Let's find out, starting with... Number 6. Maria 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 Christina Johnson was arrested for using her looks to rip off people she met on dating sites or house rentals. The interesting thing about Johnson isn't just that she's a scammer, it's the effort she puts into it. Johnson's been scamming people as far back as 1996 and has used different aliases for her scams. She's gone by Maria Hendricks, Gia Hendricks, Maria Christina Gia, and Maria Henka. Seems she really loves being called Maria. Johnson's scams often followed the same pattern. She would either date or rent from her victims to get access to their homes. After gaining this access, she would dig up personal information, use the information to open lines of credit, and spend all that money on herself. After stealing the identity of her victim, Johnson would live it up, charging thousands of dollars in expenses to the credit card of the person whose identity she'd stolen. And Johnson was brave with it too. Johnson clearly enjoyed the lifestyle it gave her and has stolen tons of identities. She's posed as a modeling agency manager, a member of NASCAR's Hendrick Motorsports team, and strangely, also as a dog trainer. 
By the time the police arrested her at a luxury resort, she had already stolen over $250,000 from the latest victim. It's crazy that she got away with her scam for so long, but unless there's a bad fight or other suspicions, people typically trust the person they're dating the most. Number five, stolen property. Daniel Kennisberg had his land stolen by a scammer who impersonated him and passed his power of attorney over to a lawyer. Kennisberg had inherited the land from his mother back in 2007. It was originally a one acre plot and his parents had used half of it to build their home while leaving the other half untouched. A few years after he inherited it, Kennisberg decided to sell the home and planned to pass on the other half acre to his children. But in the meantime, someone impersonating him gave his power of attorney to a lawyer who sold the property on his behalf. The solicitor authorized legal documents, passed on those documents to a real estate firm, and the firm began building on the half acre that belonged to Kennisburg. The real estate firm was a company called 51 Sky Top Partners, and they purchased the land for $350,000. Kennisburg had absolutely no idea what was going on. In fact, he would have been left clueless for an even longer time if a friend hadn't called him to tell him that a fellow friend had mentioned a property being built on his land. At first, Kennisberg didn't believe it. He drove down to the place himself and was shocked when he saw that a structure was already being built on his land. The real estate firm building the house had already put plans in motion to sell the home once they finished building it. Kennisberg immediately contacted his own lawyer to find out what happened. It was his lawyer who revealed the fraud and told him that someone had impersonated him and authorized the sale. Further investigation revealed that the fraud had originated in South Africa where someone had made a fake passport for Kennisberg with an incorrect birthday, photo, and address. It was this fake passport that was used to authenticate his fake identity and to appoint a Connecticut lawyer, Anthony Minnelli, as power of attorney. Once this person appointed Minnelli, the scammer had him sell the land on his behalf. Minnelli made the sale and passed the profits to the fraudster without knowing that he'd just been duped. After the real estate company discovered that they'd been scammed, they stopped work on the site. They told the media that they had no idea that the land hadn't been properly purchased and they had no contact whatsoever with the fraudster who sold it. In any case, Kennisberg decided to sue both the lawyer and the construction company. In the suit, he asked for the building to be removed from his land and that the property to be returned to him. It's unfortunate for the lawyer and construction company since they got scammed too, believing everything they were doing was above board. Number four, deeply faked. Debbie Shelton Moore was fooled by AI scammers who used artificial intelligence to impersonate her 22-year-old daughter's voice. The call lasted for approximately six minutes, and the whole time Debbie believed it was her daughter speaking to her. The scammer, who pretended to be her daughter, said that she'd been kidnapped and demanded money for her release. At first, Debbie believed that her daughter had been in a crash of some sort and was simply asking for help. She only realized that it was a kidnapping when she heard three male voices who told her that her daughter had had been kidnapped and they needed $50,000. Then Debbie heard her daughter crying in the background. The crying was enough for her to fall for the scam and believe that her daughter was in grave danger. Debbie was even more concerned when she checked her daughter's phone location and saw that she was stalled on a highway. That sort of confirmed the fake call she'd gotten because the kidnapper said she was at the back of their truck. Fortunately, the scammers didn't get what they came for. Debbie's husband, who worked in cybersecurity, overheard the conversation and suspected foul play. He FaceTimed his daughter and confirmed that she was in fact safe. With her daughter confirmed that she wasn't kidnapped, Debbie could finally calm down and see what the ruse for what it was, a cheap attempt at scamming her. She reported the case to the police and made even further checks to confirm that her daughter was definitely not kidnapped. The scammers that tried to fool Debbie and extort her are part of a growing trend of AI voice scammers in the United States. These so-called imposter scams, where scammers impersonate people in order to steal money, are very popular. They've caused Americans to lose 2.6 billion dollars in 2022 alone and that number seems to be rising one way to fight these scams is for people to have safe phrases that they can use to authenticate communication with close friends and family members that way you'll know that a request for help is probably a scam when whomever that's trying to scam you doesn't know the safe word or phrase number three scamming nasa 
As crazy as this sounds, Sapa Profiles Incorporated unbelievably sold fake aluminum to NASA for 19 years. They were only discovered after an inquiry revealed they had caused NASA to lose millions of dollars worth of scientific equipment. NASA is staffed with some of the smartest people in the world, so you would ordinarily expect it to be difficult to scam them. But Sapa Profiles Incorporated did it by selling NASA garbage aluminum while forging certification documents to prove that it was standard quality. Sapa Profiles would have continued getting away with the scam too if some of their garbage aluminum sheets weren't found on two rockets carrying satellite to space. The aluminum that was on protective shields that were supposed to detach from the rockets as they approached space. However, the shields failed to detach because they weren't the right quality, leaving the rocket too heavy to reach orbit. Since the rocket couldn't reach orbit, it failed and fell apart as it came back down to Earth. It happened twice and led to millions of dollars in equipment equipment getting destroyed. This catastrophic failure led to NASA to open an inquiry into why the rockets failed, and they discovered that they had been carrying substandard aluminum sheets. Further investigation revealed that the bad sheets came from Sapa Profiles. Investigators discovered that Sapa Profiles had been forging quality test results for over 19 years. The company had forged over 6,000 quality control tests in total. Employees of the company who tried to raise an alarm about the tests were ignored and pushed aside. One technician testified that he got daily requests for fake results and he did that by either passing materials that had failed the test or entering fake values into the report directly. Surprisingly, NASA wasn't the only company affected. 450 of the company's other clients suffered the same fate and their fraudulence led to millions of dollars in losses combined. As a result of these failures, Sapa Profiles faced civil and criminal litigation. Dennis Balius, the company's lab test manager, pled guilty to all charges and was sentenced to three years in prison. Sapa Profile's parent company, Norsk Hydro, was forced to pay around $46 million in reparations to both the U.S. government and other customers. But even that didn't make a dent in the total losses that the company's fraud caused its clients. It's pretty wild that this company got away with scamming NASA for almost 20 years, and you can't really fault NASA for getting scammed since Sapa Profiles Incorporated was a pretty reputable company. Just goes to show that even big companies need to be double checked. And if you really think about it, the lab test manager most likely was just the fall guy and someone higher up was telling him to make the fake test results. Number two, congrats, you're married. A Hong Kong woman whose name wasn't released was tricked into a scam marriage where she got married to a stranger. The woman had merely wanted to learn makeup artistry online and had gone on Facebook to search for apprenticeship opportunities. However, the company that she applied to convinced her to not learn makeup but event planning. So the woman took this advice and went for a week of training on event planning in Hong Kong. After the training, she was told she needed to participate in a fake wedding to complete her training. But there was one caveat. This fake wedding would take place in mainland China. So the woman decided to go to the wedding since it was part of her training course. When she got there, she was dressed as a bride and participated in the wedding. She was also told to sign real wedding certificates by the company. They told her that the wedding would be canceled shortly after the ceremony. However, when she returned to Hong Kong, she realized that she'd been tricked. The wedding was not canceled, and she had gotten married. She reported the case to the police, but they couldn't do anything since there was no evidence that a crime occurred. That was when she approached the Hong Kong Federation of Trade Unions for intervention. The union revealed that such scams were quite common, and about a thousand of them happen yearly. One reason why people perpetuate the scam is that people who get married to Hong Kong residents can enter the country legally and live there. It's most likely that the victim's fake husband, whom she doesn't even know, has entered Hong Kong with the marriage certificate. Number one, accounts held hostage. Kathy Kitterzinski lost her Instagram account to hackers after spending over $150,000 and countless hours building her business's brand. And all of that happened without her clicking even one dodgy link. The entire saga began when Kathy, who had 44,000 followers on Instagram at the time, decided to get the elusive blue tick. There were several accounts pretending to be hers doing fake giveaways, so she wanted the blue tick 
to authenticate her account. However, that plan backfired when she was texted by a page pretending to be Instagram's official page. The page looked real, and it had 800 million followers. There were also a lot of important brands following the page. But that should have been Kathy's red flag, since no account has even 700 million followers on Instagram. The most followed Instagram page currently is still Instagram itself, with roughly 656 million followers. The scam page didn't send her any link, it just told her that she'd been given a blue tick, and she needed to log out of her page and log back in to access it. Kathy believed all of this was normal procedure, so she did as she was told. She logged out of her account, but when she tried logging in, she was alerted that a third-party app was trying to log in as well from an untrusted location. She immediately tried to log them out, but they had already gotten in and changed the language from English to Turkish. Before she could translate the language to do anything, they had logged her out and switched on two-factor authentication. Kathy thought she had two-factor authentication activated, but even that couldn't save her. Within a few minutes, they had taken over her account. She reported the case to Meta, but the company didn't reach out. The only ones that reached out were the scammers. They told her to pay $400 for her account, but Kathy didn't want to. She knew that the account was probably worth more to them than $400, and that the first $400 would merely be a way for them to extort more money from her. So instead of paying, she ignored them and stopped replying to their messages. They kept on texting that they would delete her page if she didn't reply, but she remained steadfast. In the end, the scammers made good on their promise and deleted the page. But that wasn't the end of the story, because Kathy somehow managed to get her page back without paying the hackers. It was a smart thing that she refused to pay them that initial $400 because they probably would have used it to funnel even more money from her. What are some of the craziest things people are doing for love these days? Let's find out, starting with number five, Dr. Sugar Mama. When Dr. Liz Todd first met Christopher, two words popped in the head. Perfectly normal. Except, he was anything but that. She was defrauded of over 160,000 pounds by him. Dr. Liz had no idea that the man she met on Plenty of Fish was a serial scammer with 133 previous fraud convictions and had been to jail seven times. His real name is Christopher Haynes, but he was going by Chris Smith when they met. Dr. Liz was single since it seemed like all she did was work, so she signed up on Plenty of Fish. She matched with Haynes, who said that his profession was a lawyer. Liz found out that they had a lot in common when they started chatting over email, so eventually they decided to meet in person for coffee. The coffee date went really well, and Liz says she remembers feeling that he was pleasantly normal. She had no idea that he was the most abnormal person she would ever meet. Smith said he was living with his father after relocating from London and said that he wanted to move out to his place. He told her that he had his eyes on a 2,500 pound a month flat in a manor house in Hexham, Northumberland. He asked Liz to help him secure the lease because he had some temporary problems with his finances. The financial hiccups didn't seem weird to Liz since he seemed to be a pretty well-off lawyer. He had lots of documents proving a six-figure salary, a multi-million pound rental portfolio, and an investment set to mature early the following year to the tune of 300,000 pounds. Smith also had a lot of legal case files and spent a lot of time arguing with business partners over large sums of money. Liz occasionally even drove him to court dates all over the country which gave her the extra assurance that he was who he said he was. Because why would he be going to court if he weren't? But those documents were all fake, and his phone calls weren't phone calls at all. Through all this, Liz continued to cough up more money for Smith's mounting expenses. He had builders and decorators renovate his flat and passed off all those expenses to Liz with the excuse that he had problems with his cash flow. Liz, on the other hand, went with all of this because she believed that she might, eventually, also move into the flat in the end. She believed it would be their future home, so didn't see anything wrong with investing in it. Smith always made sure 
sure not to directly ask Liz for cash, so she was only funding things like his lease and renovations, not giving him cash directly. After just three months, she loaned him roughly 50,000 pounds. Liz was so far gone that even when Smith confessed to her that he'd been in prison for bribery-related offenses, she believed him and trusted him even more. This is a trick that fraudsters like to play. Confess a little bit, and get a lot of trust in return. But surprise, his confession contained a lie. Yes, Smith had been in prison, but it wasn't for bribery, it was for fraud. And the bills continued to pile up. Smith hired maids and didn't have the money to pay them, so Dr. Liz footed that bill as well. Smith wasn't only getting money from Dr. Liz, he'd also managed to get her mother to loan him 125,000 pounds from her savings. She'd believed that she was helping him, and by extension, her daughter, get through a tough financial situation. When Liz found out Smith actually went to her mom for money, she was outraged and confronted Smith about it. He said he was sorry and that he had just gone to her mom for the money because he didn't want to bother her. Despite this, Liz still believed that he would repay her and her mother. But that delusion was shattered when a builder working on Smith's home texted her a link to a newspaper article about Smith's former cons. Liz quickly found out that his real name wasn't Christopher Smith, but Christopher Haynes. This discovery left her heartbroken and totally disillusioned with the relationship. Unfortunately, she still stayed with him because she didn't know the extent of his lies. Liz later found out that he'd also been cheating on her, which was finally the breaking point. She moved back to her flat and started making plans to cut off Smith. She couldn't completely leave him because at the time, she thought she would get back her money when his £300,000 investment matured. But Liz eventually discovered that there was no investment and it was all lies. She also learned that whenever she dropped him off for his court cases, he went to hotels with adult escorts for a raunchy time. He was so brazen with his scam, he even rented a castle called Sandho Hall, just so he could impress other women with her money. And we can't forget the BMW he leased, so he could drive these other women to the castle. That's when Smith began to threaten her if she ever went to the police with her story. In the end, she found the courage to go to the police, and Smith was arrested. He was tried and eventually sentenced to nine and a half years in jail. The judge that handed down his sentence said he'd never seen someone as despicable as Smith in his 40 years of practice. And the thing is, Dr. Liz wasn't a fool, and she was dating this guy in real life, which is terrifying. Sadly, these types of scams can literally happen to anyone. It doesn't matter how intelligent you are. Remember, if it seems too good to be true, it is. Number four, the trouble with dating actors. Michaela, a film artist from Kentucky, fell victim to a romance scammer who pretended to be part of the cast of the hit show Stranger Things. However, Michaela didn't just fall for this scammer. She also sent her husband been packing for him. Michaela joined an online artist forum to connect with other people. One of her reasons for joining this group was because her relationship with her husband wasn't great. In the group, she met someone with the username DKMH and they got close. Soon, the user revealed that he was actually Dacre Montgomery, who played Billy Hargreaves in Stranger Things. Since DKMH was the title of Montgomery's poetry book, Michaela took it as a sign that he was the real deal. They even started dating without seeing each other physically. After a while, DKMH told her to pick between him and her husband, and Michaela did exactly that. She quickly divorced her husband and kicked him out of her home. Now that she was living alone with her seven-year-old, DKMH began his mission. He soon started asking her for money and claimed that his girlfriend, Liz Pollock, controlled his finances and made him broke. Over time, Michaela sent him about $10,000 through gift cards and crypto. When she discovered that she'd been had by a romance scammer, Michaela was devastated. She hadn't just lost money, she also divorced her husband based on a lie. Michaela made her bed, and now she's got to lie in it. What do you think? Did Michaela get what she deserved for divorcing her husband for a person she never met? Or is she a real victim who is played by a particularly ruthless scammer? Let us know in the comments below. Number three, student loans are tough. Shishui Li, a first-year master's student at Brown University, scammed an unnamed 74-year-old woman he met on a dating site out of $30,000. He told her that he was going to use the money to open a school for children in Dubai, but no such school existed. Li used the money for his tuition and living expenses instead, which isn't the worst thing, but he also bought a BMW for good measure. Li first met his victim on a dating site for older people. He told her that he was 60 years old and fed her fantastic stories 
things about building schools and helping children. Lee's scam first came to the police's attention after the Bank of America noticed that his account had received $181,000 in deposits from around the U.S. Many of the deposits came from accounts that had been previously linked with fraud. So the bank froze his account. But Lee had a clever story for them. He explained that he had a friend who lived overseas and was sending him money. When asked about the multiple accounts sending the money, he said he had no idea how his friend did it, which was really convenient. Apparently, Lee was actually working with a cabal of scammers in Nigeria, and he wasn't willing to tell on them. Those scammers used his bank account to coordinate the proceeds of hundreds of thousands in scams from all over the country. And now he's been arrested. We kind of wonder if he eventually ratted out his Nigerian friends, but we somehow think he didn't. Number two, paging Dr. Scammer. 76-year-old widow Jennifer Dennis lost her life savings of roughly $70,000 to a cruel romance scammer. She now has to live in an RV as a result. Jennifer met the scammer on Facebook and he called himself Caleb. Caleb told Jennifer he was a Red Cross doctor working in Yemen and said that he would soon return to the US. Jennifer had lost her husband in 2020, so she was looking for some sort of companionship. Before long, Jennifer and Caleb entered into a romantic relationship. Caleb then told her that he was going to be returning home, but there was a tiny problem. He wanted to settle down in a new area because he had lost his wife. But in order to do this, he had to purchase a new home. He told Jennifer that he'd already paid $600,000 for the home, but still needed an additional bit to complete the purchase. Caleb sent her fake documents proving all of it and even told her the location of the house. Jennifer believed him and sent $70,000 for the purchase and an additional $8,700 dollars for other expenses. At this point, Jennifer thought the purchase was a done deal, so she and her son packed their things and traveled to the house hoping to move in. When she got to the house, she found out that the people already lived there and that she'd been scammed. She had to sleep in the car with her son that night. Since that $70,000 was all she had, Jennifer and her son had to get an RV from a church member to stay while they figured out their situation. The whole story kind of makes you wonder why her son didn't step in and stop this from happening since he was living with her. Number one, the Cupid of Chaos. Michael Middleton was one busy scammer. He married not one, not two, not three, but he married at least four different women in four different states. Michael Middleton, who's been named in the media as the Cupid of Chaos, married four women between 2006 and 2016 to get access to their money. In 2013, he married a woman named Alice Grant and scammed her out of at least $20,000. She only found out that he was already married when she called a number he often called and discovered that he had another wife. That's when Michael's secrets began to unravel. Grant contacted the police about Michael and accused him of fraud amongst other things. But even that wasn't enough to nail him down. He ran away and very soon got married again to another woman named Ashley Clymer in another state. Clymer is a developmentally challenged woman and she married Michael only one month after knowing him. Soon Clymer got pregnant for him and gave birth. But the Cupid of Chaos didn't feel like raising the child. So instead, he decided to forge the signature of his present wife, Climber and use it to put up their child with her for adoption without her knowledge. While all of this was happening with Climber, Middleton's other wife, Alice Grant, was still looking for him so that she could get their marriage annulled. Alice didn't find him, but she did find two other women that Grant had gotten married to. The three women went to the authorities and Michael's legal troubles began. At this point, he was still stringing Climber along, and she said he made her stay in horrible motels as she traveled the country with him. When Climber found out that her supposed husband had gotten married to three other women, she was hurt and decided to join forces with the other women to bring him down. Michael was eventually arrested and charged with multiple counts of bigamy, to which he pled guilty. The judge then handed down a 12-month suspended sentence, which seems a little light, considering he tried to adopt out a child without the mom's consent. What are some of the most rampant crimes criminals are doing today? Let's find out, starting with... Number six, flash mobs. A wave of flash robberies has struck Southern California, leaving high-end retailers and department stores vulnerable. These flash robberies involve a group of thieves overwhelming store employees and security before making a quick getaway. One incident occurred at a Nordstrom rack in Riverside where a group of six thieves targeted designer handbags, making off with thousands of dollars worth of merchandise. The Nordstrom rack was hit twice in one summer, first in July and again in August. 
Surveillance footage from the first mob shows a group of men and women entering the store and immediately heading for the handbag section. They snatched the bags from display shelves and ripped off security lock devices before finally taking off. In another incident at a Macy's store in downtown LA, a group of at least five thieves ransacked the store, loading designer perfume bottles into trash bags. Then, in Glendale, three women were arrested for stealing approximately $30,000 worth of designer handbags from another store. These flash robberies have become a recurring problem in California. In one incident, over 30 thieves overran a YSL store in Glendale, making off with an estimated $300,000 worth of merchandise. Luxury denim stores, Nike outlets, and Gucci boutiques have also been targeted, often resulting in losses exceeding 100,000 bucks. While some arrests have been made in connection with these flash robberies, a zero cash bail policy has gotten in the way of law enforcement's ability to curb the rise in such crimes. The policy allows people that are arrested and charged with crimes to be released without paying anything up front. In response to this crime spree, Los Angeles Mayor Karen Bass said that these aren't victimless crimes, emphasizing the need for safety while shopping in the city and opening businesses without fear. Law enforcement agencies announced the establishment of a new task force to address flash mobs in Southern California. It's a problem that local authorities are working hard to combat, but the impact on Cali's reputation as a travel destination remains to be seen. Let us know what you think in the comments. And remember the days when a flash mob just meant a bunch of people doing a choreographed dance in random places? People seemed a lot happier back then, didn't they? Number five, smashed and grabbed. An all too familiar scene unfolded at a San Francisco beach where several groups of tourists fell victim to a smash and grab that left them without their belongings, including without their passports. Some unfortunate European tourists got a nice San Francisco welcome as their vacations were interrupted when their cars were ransacked all in a 10 minute window. Among the affected visitors was a group from Malta who were on only their second day in San Francisco. The experience of course made them consider cutting their trip short and return to Europe. The aftermath of these crimes was captured on video. The footage depicted the vandalized trucks of the tourists' cars and shattered glass thrown across the ground. The victims lost everything they'd brought with them, from passports and cameras to phones, iPads, laptops, and luggage. The smash and grab happened at the northernmost tip of Ocean Beach in San Francisco, further displaying the city's escalating crime rates. While some viewers seemed to feel bad for the victims, others questioned the wisdom of tourists choosing to visit a city that's becoming known more for its ballooning crime rate rather than its bridge. San Francisco has been grappling with a surge in car break-ins in 2023. Criminals have adopted a strategy in which they swiftly smash car windows and make a quick getaway, often targeting multiple parked vehicles in a single day. Despite the presence of warnings posted throughout the city, advising residents and tourists not to leave valuables in their cars, the crime rate has remained stubbornly high. Neighborhoods frequented by tourists have reported some of the highest rates of car break-ins. In response to the ongoing issue, City Supervisor Dean Press has called for a hearing involving city officials, the police, and other relevant departments to address the problem collectively. However, the effectiveness of law enforcement in resolving these crimes has been a subject of concern, with arrest rates for car break-ins dwindling to under, get this, 1%. Isn't it kind of ironic that a city that was once known for having the toughest prison in the U.S. is now known for its rampant crime? Number 4. Carjacked and it's not just smash and grabs. Entire vehicles are just getting taken out in the open. A group of tourists in San Francisco found themselves thrown from their vehicle as they tried to thwart a robbery. The incident was captured on video and shows the escalating issue of vehicle break-ins and thefts plaguing San Francisco. The incident occurred when Dmitry Koval, along with his friends, had parked their two vans at the Fort Mason Center in the Marina District of San Francisco. They had hoped to enjoy the scenic beauty and get something to eat, but their plans took a terrifying turn when a black SUV pulled up next to one of the vans. These two guys quickly jumped out of the SUV, breaking into Koval and his friends' vans, and started grabbing their stuff. The victims watched in shock as their bags were thrown into the black SUV, so Koval's friends sprang into action and attempted to stop the thieves. However, bystanders cautioned them, worrying the guys might be armed. Despite the warning, Koval's friends continued their pursuit. One of them grabbed the driver's side window and tried to take control of the wheel, while another 
grappled with the suspect sitting in the passenger seat. In a desperate bid to stop the getaway, they used crutches to shatter the windshield. However, the thief at the wheel pushed the gas down, throwing one of Koval's friends onto the pavement where he sustained severe injuries. The vehicle continued to speed away with another victim clinging to the passenger side before he was thrown from the moving SUV. The thieves escaped. Having made off with approximately $10,000 worth of cash, laptops, documents, and passports. The incident left Koval and his friends traumatized, and they questioned the safety of even visiting San Francisco. This incident demonstrates the rampant issue of vehicle break ins and thefts in the city, a problem so common that it's earned the nickname Bipping and Boosting. And that attempt to stop the robbery could have gone real sideways real fast. Please remember that items and cash can be replaced, but your life can't. Number three, a little too good to be true. A young student in Australia got caught in a nightmare after he thought he had found a great deal on Facebook Marketplace. Umair Ishfaq is a native Pakistani man living in Perth. He shelled out $6,500 in cash for a 2018 Holden Astra so he could kickstart his career as an Uber driver. The deal was incredible, since typically that car sells for over $17,000. Just five days after making the cash payment, the worst possible scenario unfolded. Late at night, a dreaded knock on his door came. It was Western Australian police officers who arrived to deliver some bad news. His recently purchased car was, in fact, stolen. Mr. Ishfak was shocked and tried to explain that he had all the proper documentation, including a personal property securities register report, which confirmed his ownership. However, the police insisted the car had been stolen and they promptly impounded it. This unfortunate incident is a reminder to all of us. Beware of deals that seem too good to be true. The lesson here is crystal clear. If you come across a deal that appears too good to be true, exercise extreme caution. Even after Ishvac performed all necessary checks, including verifying the vehicle's history, the sale ended up being bogus. While online marketplaces can offer genuine deals, they can also be hotspots for scams. Trust your instincts. And if something feels off, like a good car that that's listed way below market value, it's better to walk away from the deal rather than to be scammed. Do you have any stories of deals too good to be true that actually turned out amazing for you? Let us know in the comment section. Number two, skimming right off the top. French-Brazilian tourist Douglas da Silva Rangel ran a sophisticated ATM skimming scam that scammed ATM customers out of almost $78,000. Rangel had installed skimming devices inside the card readers of ATMs, making them exceptionally difficult to detect compared to external skimmers. These devices secretly harvested card information, which Wrangle then used to clone their stolen cards. Adding another layer to the scheme was small cameras were discreetly placed near the ATMs to capture unsuspecting customers entering their PIN numbers. This approach allowed Wrangle to swiftly gather sensitive data all within seconds. Law enforcement, through extensive surveillance, eventually caught Wrangle in the act as he attempted to withdraw cash using fake ATM cards. Upon searching his house, police uncovered 22,100 bucks in cash, five ATM skimming devices, fake ATM ceiling panels with concealed cameras, as well as blank iTunes gift cards. During the legal proceedings, Wrangle claimed that he committed these offenses to support his son and ex-girlfriend, who both live overseas, with the ex suffering from a brain injury. But he can Confess to actually using the stolen funds to buy a BMW. What makes this case even more insane is that Wrangle attempted to run the scam again while out on bail, leading to his rearrest. He must have really wanted to support that ex. So he got himself a three and a half year prison sentence with the possibility of parole after serving seven months. To avoid falling victim to such scams, it's always a good idea to take money out from inside rank branches. While random ATMs offer convenience, the scam is so prevalent that really any ATM outside of the bank puts you at risk. Number one, spotlighting San Francisco. And we're back in San Francisco, again. A prominent news reporter became the victim of a group of teenagers who tried to steal his bike. It all went down in the Presidio National Park area near the iconic Golden Gate Bridge on a weekend afternoon. Dan Noyles, an award-winning investigative reporter for ABC7 Bay Area, was enjoying a bike ride when he encountered a large group of roughly 15 teenagers. As he approached the group, one of the teenagers suddenly rushed him. The impact sent noise crashing to the ground, injuring his left elbow. But instead of giving in to the would-be thief, noise quickly got back on his feet, 
determined to protect his property. He chased after the teenager who had attempted to steal his bike, and in a moment of quick thinking, threatened to expose the incident on Channel 7 News. Turns out, that worked and the teenagers scattered in different directions. The incident left Noyes hospitalized with a large bruise on his left elbow and a head fracture. He also captured video footage of the teenagers fleeing the scene, revealing the brazen nature of the robbery attempt. What's particularly concerning about these incidents is that they reflect a broader trend of rising crime and deteriorating safety in San Francisco. As San Francisco faces these challenges, it raises the question, is the city still worth visiting for tourists? The allure of its iconic landmarks, cultural attractions, and scenic beauty is undoubted. But the growing concerns about crime may make travelers think twice about planning a trip to the city by the bay. Who are some of the most heartless criminals who would probably scam their own mom? Let's find out, starting with... Number 7. Just for Shoes Two fraudsters targeted senior citizens, swindling them out of nearly $600,000. The heartless duo, Tavoy Malcolm and Lorindo Powell, had a slick routine. They'd call up these sweet elderly folks and tell them how they won the lottery or some big sweepstakes. But there was a catch, of course. The victims had to fork over some cash for taxes and fees to claim their supposed winnings. One victim was a 77-year-old lady who was promised a financial windfall, but instead of riches, she was taken for a ride. Powell took over the con after it was started, relentlessly pressuring her to pay up. The fake tax payments made the woman fall behind on her mortgage, and the payments she did make were sent to Powell after he convinced her he'd handle everything. The missed payments caused her to eventually lose her home, forcing her to rent a room. Then there was a 91-year-old woman who got caught in the same sweepstakes trap. Malcolm and Powell convinced her to write checks and hand over control of her bank accounts. Then they went on a shopping spree for designer shoes with her credit card, spending over $10,000. Powell was finally caught and ended up with a 51-month sentence. In total, Powell scammed five senior citizens, including a 90-something woman living in a New Jersey retirement home, and a Maryland couple with dementia who he took for over $120,000. While Powell claims to have changed their ways and offered an apology, prosecutors said what jumped out most about the case was the total lack of remorse Powell displayed. Do you know anyone who's been hit by this scam? Tell us about it in the comments. Number six, the Jamaican lottery. Don J. Williams, a Jamaican man from Montego Bay, got nabbed for being a part of a Jamaican lottery scam. He was charged with conspiracy, wire fraud, and money laundering. The syndicate he works with called him a lead broker, the middleman who traded in what they called sucker lists, lists of people that scammers thought they could easily trick. Sanjay was the only one among a group of 32 to take his chances at a trial, while a dozen others were chilling in Jamaica waiting for their turn in the hot seat. The group ran their scam like this. Scammers would call unsuspecting people, mostly older folks who were just going about their business. They'd tell them tales of winning millions, but there was a catch, because there's always a catch. The victims had to fork over some big bucks for taxes and fees. Edna Schmidt is an elderly lady from North Dakota. She got a call saying she'd won a cool $19 million in a brand new car. All she had to do was pay up on the taxes. But the problem was this so-called winning process dragged on until Edna had lost her entire life savings of around $300,000. Edna eventually contacted the authorities over the situation and ended up bringing the whole thing down. The investigation that followed exposed over 70 people who'd been scammed out of a whopping $5.2 million. These victims came from all walks of life, from business owners to a World War II fighter pilot, and some of them were still shelling out cash to the scammers just weeks before the trial. During Sanjay's time in court, about a dozen victims testified against 
against him, both in person and by video, and authorities combed through about 50,000 emails and 500,000 documents, adding to the piles of evidence. After the jury deliberated, the judge dropped the hammer, and Sanjay got hit with a brutal 20-year prison sentence. However, that sentence may be reduced if he cooperates with the investigations into the Jamaican lottery scam, which has been a growing problem. With a sentence that large, it's likely he will. Remember to let your loved ones know that if they didn't play, they definitely didn't win. Number 5. Fake Rich Neil Casson was a smooth-talking con man who fancied himself as a Ferrari-driving playboy living large on a supposed 1.25 million pound lottery win. But Neil didn't win any lottery, and his life of luxury was built on a towering stack of lies. Neil, from Galgate, Lancashire in the UK, had a knack of duping just about anyone he met. He claimed he won big on the national lottery, and lovers, financiers, and even business businesses fell victim to his grand deception to the tune of over 300,000 pounds. But beneath the thin veneer of a lottery millionaire, Neil was nothing more than a penniless scam artist. His game plan? He hoodwinked unsuspecting investors into his elaborate schemes to import jet skis and sewing machines and promise them riches beyond their wildest dreams. He used the investment money to finance a Ferrari. Casson's most despicable act, though, was targeting vulnerable women. He sweet-talked them into handing over their life savings, all all in the name of get-rich-quick schemes. One woman went as far as selling her house to fund his extravagant lifestyle, a decision she would soon come to deeply regret. Neil's house of cards finally came crashing down when he had a falling out with a friend. The friend, apparently wanting to get back at him for some issue with the business deal, posted a video of Casson speeding way too fast in his Ferrari. The police caught wind of the video, and Casson eventually found himself in Preston Crown Court. He couldn't talk his way out of this one either, so he pleaded guilty to 20 counts of fraud. The judge handed down a nearly five-year prison sentence, and for a moment, justice seemed to prevail. But fast forward a couple years later, and Neil was back on the streets. He was on social security because he said he couldn't work, but he still had tricks up his sleeve. Casson tapped into funds from family members and tried his luck with some bets at the bookies. Neil wagered over 2,000 pounds on UK soccer team Aston Villa's promotion to the Premier League, and he ended up winning. But before he could even enjoy the money, the 5,700 150 pound jackpot was frozen under the proceeds of crime act the court had to decide if he could keep it. In the end, Neil was ordered to pay £11,000 to his victims, which was pretty much all that remained of the £300,000 he had swindled. And for good measure, the court decided to toss that betting win into the mix too. Casson said the only way he knew how to make money was by gambling, and he promised he would pay his victims in full if he won. And the fact that he actually said that in court makes us think he didn't learn anything, and that we'll be doing an update real soon. Number four, Grandma Scammed. Imagine being 66 years old, looking forward to your retirement, when suddenly a simple phone call shatters your dreams. That's exactly what happened to Mary Marshall, a great-grandmother from Australia. Mary got a phone call, and on the other end was someone who claimed to be from the Commonwealth's bank fraud department. The caller spoke perfect English and knew things about her account that no stranger should. The caller told Mary that her account was tampered with, and to secure her money, she should open a new account and move her cash there. He said she needed to confirm her identity using an app, and when she downloaded it, the scammer cleaned out her savings, taking $13,392 and leaving her just $2.60. This crook then went on a spending spree with her credit card. Mary, completely freaked out, explained the whole thing to her daughter, Christina, and together they went to the bank. But the bank told Mary that her money was gone. And not only that, but they demanded she pay back all the cash spent by the scammer, including any interest and fees. The bank, in what they somehow thought would be a great PR move, offered her $2,863 to cover the funds, but they wanted $1,616 of that back. Yeah, it's not backbreaking, but geez, if these guys don't have a heart. Mary envisioned a happy retirement, but instead, she was thrust into this nightmare, grappling with a future of uncertainty. What's even sadder is that Mary isn't alone in this kind of ordeal. Scammers often target elderly people who work their entire lives and are now in their twilight years, making them easy targets. And it's not like they can just jump back into the labor force either due to their age. Number three, like father, not like son. 
In the world of finance, where fortunes are made and lost with the blink of an eye, one Ivy League graduate scheme sent shockwaves through the industry. Andrew Kasperson, a man who took betrayal to a whole new level, defrauding investors of nearly $95 million and leaving a trail of deceit that led to his dramatic arrest. It all started with Kasperson setting up what seemed like a legit investment fund called Irving Place Capital Partners 3 SPV. He had big dreams for it and managed to convince people, including private equity firms, friends, family, and even a charity fund to invest nearly $95 million in this venture. But here's the twist. He also set up another company with a suspiciously similar name, Irving Place 3 SPV LLC, where the money was really going. But instead of making smart investments, Kasperson decided to bet big time on the stock market. And they were high risk bets too, especially on options, contracts related to the S&P 500 index, which became his thing. And guess what? He lost big, real big. Andrew had managed to secure $25 million from unsuspecting investors for his fake fund. But when he went knocking on the door for another $20 million from an old Princeton buddy, that friend got a whiff of something fishy. What he uncovered was a web of deception, fake email addresses, shady domain names, and made up financiers, all part of Kesperson's elaborate ruse to cover his tracks. So the friend promptly reported it to the authorities. Kasperson was arrested at New York's LaGuardia Airport, and the investigation revealed that among the people who got swindled were Kasperson's own family, including two of his brothers and even his mom, Barbara, who poured $3 million into what she thought was her son's legitimate fund. And to make matters worse, Kasperson's dad is none other than Finn M.W. Kasperson, a big shot philanthropist and former CEO of Beneficial Group. This guy used to be worth hundreds of millions of dollars, before he tragically took his own life in 2009. So the point is, it's not like Kasperson needed the money. Following his arrest, Kasperson was released on $5 million bail, and during this time, he had been cooperating with authorities and offered apologies to his family for losing millions in his fraudulent scheme. In court, Kasperson faced charges of securities and wire fraud, which could lead to a maximum sentence of 40 years in prison. Kasperson's betrayal not only shattered the trust of those who knew him, but also exposed the dark underbelly of white-collar crime. In the end, the man who had once been part of an elite circle of Ivy League graduates found himself facing the prospect of a long and uncertain future behind bars. The crazy thing is Kasperson not only came from wealth, but he graduated from Princeton in 99 and Harvard Law School in 2002. The guy had the education and family connections to basically write his own paycheck. You can have all the brains in the world and still be dumb. Number 2. Confining Mon self-proclaimed liberal Sherpa named Kathy Aru used to be a regular guest on Fox News. But things took a seriously dark turn and she's been accused of some pretty heinous stuff. Allegedly, Aru swindled at least $224,000 from her own elderly mom and brace yourselves, quite literally dragged her to a nursing home against her will. Seriously, who does that to their own mom? Here's a little backstory. Aru used to pop up pretty regularly on Fox news shows as a guest, but in 2020, she filed a lawsuit against some heavyweights such as Sean Hannity and Tucker Carlson. The lawsuit, which had to do with some alleged harassment, was eventually tossed out by a judge, but that's not where things ended. Apparently, Aru had falsified documents to take control of her mom's home. She even drained money from her mom's reverse mortgage and savings account. Then, she allegedly took out credit cards in her mom's name and used them for her own gain. Aru's Fox News profile was wiped clean after this whole scandal blew up and her liberal Sherpa podcast probably isn't going to be making a comeback anytime soon. But all that wasn't even the worst thing she did. Prosecutors said everything started when they got wind that Aru was exploiting her own mother. One day, she allegedly tricked her mom into thinking they were going out for ice cream with her granddaughters, but instead, she took her to a nursing home using a revoked power of attorney. When her mom tried to call for help, Aru allegedly told the staff not to let her use the phone or see any visitors. Doctors and officials eventually said her mom was competent to make her own decisions, so they sent her back home. But Aru and another person allegedly dragged her mom literally from her house and took her to another facility. And again, she was found competent and sent home. Aru was finally caught and brought to face her numerous felony charges, including exploitation of the elderly, kidnapping, and organized scheme to defraud. Kathy was sent to jail where she was being held without bond, and we wouldn't exactly feel bad if she were actually dragged into jail either.
Number one, tugging heartstrings. Chrissy Frazier, a retired real estate agent, never thought that an insignificant text message could lead to a significant financial loss. Little did she know that she was about to fall victim to a scam that would cost her over 4,400 pounds. Chrissy was going about her day when a text from her daughter, Camilla, flashed on her screen. Camilla lived in Chicago and Chrissy lived in the UK, so hearing from her was always special. Camilla's message was simple, a request for a roughly 1,200 pound loan. Chrissy had been helping Camilla with the sale of her flat in West London, so helping her out with this seemed like second nature. Chrissy sent the money through her mobile banking app. Camilla continued to chat with her mom about the flat sale, sharing details and asking questions. Everything seemed normal until Camilla said she needed more money, this time £983.20 to cover a late payment fee. Chrissy didn't hesitate and sent over the cash. But that wasn't the end of it. Camilla came back, asking for another £2,210.44 to settle her problems once and for all. Chrissy's motherly instincts kicked in, and she felt compelled to send the money to help her daughter. But as she was about to hit the button for another payment, her bank intervened. Chrissy's account had been frozen due to suspicious activity. At this point, alarm bells started ringing. Chrissy had a gut feeling that something was off. Chrissy decided to make a call to the number Camilla had been texting from, but all she got was a weird screechy noise. Camilla explained it away, saying her speaker was broken, but the feeling in Chrissy's gut just wouldn't go away. The messages from Camilla became even more insistent, almost demanding that Chrissy make the payment. Then, in a brave move, Chrissy told the scammer that she was going to call the police. What followed was unexpected. The scammer actually taunted her with a message and sent a picture of himself out shopping with Chrissy's hard-earned money. Chrissy felt a mix of anger, fear, and betrayal. She had fallen victim to a ruthless scam that preys on parents' love for their children, dubbed the mom and dad scam. This scam hits where it hurts most, the heart. It takes advantage of the natural instinct to help our loved ones, and it leaves victims emotionally shaken and financially drained. In the end, Chrissy was able to get half of her lost money back from Santander, but the experience left her feeling disillusioned. Chrissy believed the bank could have done more to protect her. The story serves as a reminder to always double check before sending money, especially when it comes to family. Scammers are getting smarter, and we all need to protect ourselves and our loved ones. What are some of the clearest signs of a scam? Let's find out. Starting with... Number six. Old guy gets scammed by a girl he tried to help. Waitress Anissa Yega scammed $100,000 from an 84-year-old widower. Donald Hodgins met Yega and she worked as a waitress at a restaurant he always went to. Pretty soon, she was cleaning his house as a side hustle. Yega told Hodgins that she had a terminal brain tumor so he began helping her with money for car payments, student loans, and other bills she couldn't afford. She also asked for $30,000 for surgery on the tumor. Although Hodgins thought he was saving her life, Yega didn't have a tumor. She took the money and had a nice vacation in Miami. What a great person. Like nearly everyone, Yega had a lot of excuses for why she needed money, like telling Hodgins that she needed $500 for medicine for her sick mother. Hodgins didn't have a lot of family around him, but thankfully an acquaintance reported the situation to local law enforcement. The authorities froze Yegas' bank accounts and arrested her. Yegas' lawyer argued that Hodgins willingly gave Yega gifts because he was attracted to her and made up the scam allegations when he found out she was in a relationship with another man which was probably at least somewhat true, but it's a hard argument to say that Hodgins made up her making up that she had a brain tumor. It sounds like this was a classic case of an older guy wanting to help a pretty young girl who used her looks and charm to scam money from him. Seniors are getting targeted more and more, so it's important to maintain connections with them. It's almost always friends and family that stop these scams from happening. Number five, way too good to be true. An Austin mom, known only as Katie, exposed a MacBook cheating husband scam where scammers offered to give away free laptops for a small shipping fee. Katie responded to a posting in a local buy-sell group on Facebook offering to give away a brand new MacBook. The poster claimed they bought the laptop as a gift for their husband, but caught him cheating and wanted to get rid of it. Katie wanted the computer for her daughter and reached out immediately. The scammer told her that they had recently moved away from the Austin area, but would still give Katie the laptop for free if she could cover 
cover the cost of shipping. Excited to get a free laptop, Katie agreed and sent $55 to the poster through Venmo. But when she asked for the tracking number, the scammer stopped responding. So Katie started to worry that the offer was too good to be true, but kept messaging the poster to see if the MacBook had shipped anyway. The poster eventually told her that it would be an additional $80 to send it overnight and that she needed to cover insurance since they were unable to send the device without it. Katie luckily realized it was a scam and told the fraudster she was no longer interested. But the scammer urged her to send more money and called her repeatedly on Facebook Messenger. Katie searched MacBook cheating husband on Facebook and found hundreds of identical posts to the ones she saw. She reported the scam to the local group's administrator, reported dozens of other posts to Facebook, and alerted Venmo about the account the scammer was using to collect funds. The scam is clever because it might not seem like a big scam on its own, but it was clearly targeting thousands of people on a daily basis. It's effective because it's not too greedy. And good old Facebook told Katie that the posts didn't violate community standards and refused to take them down. Because, of course, right? So she reached out to CBS Austin to help her raise awareness for the scam. Katie was lucky she lost such a small amount, and her story is a reminder that if it's too good to be true, then it's too good to be true. Number four, The Sting. An 81-year-old grandfather from New Zealand, who didn't wish to be named, lost his life savings after scammers targeted his bank account. It started with a phone call from someone claiming to be a police officer. They told the grandfather that they were working on a sting and wanted to transfer money into his account as part of it. He agreed to help and followed their instructions on who to send the cash to. So the victim actually went inside his bank to transfer $40,000 to an offshore account that he'd never used before. His request should have raised some red flags for the teller processing the transaction. But of course, the bank couldn't be bothered. So he successfully transferred the money and never saw it again. The money was supposed to be for his son and granddaughter, and he was determined to recover the money. So the grandfather made a series of impassioned phone calls to multiple banks in an effort to make them review their practices. The bank claimed its staff showed the man materials on how to spot scams and asked him questions to confirm that he was transferring his funds to a secure account. Which is just such nonsense, isn't it? Well, we gave him a pamphlet. Oh, what else do you want? Obviously, the 81-year-old man thinking he's helping the police is to blame. Victim advocates stood up for him and called for financial institutions to implement stricter security measures. Scammers often groom their victims and banks intervening with potential devastating transactions could save people tens of thousands of dollars. The organization, Consumer New Zealand, acknowledged that the country's banking system was behind on security and pointed out that there was an increase in scams. Sadly, the grandfather still hasn't recovered the money he lost. Anytime a government agency asks you to transfer money to help out an investigation, it's a scam. The government has enough of your money already. They don't need more to bust the bad guys. Number three, tech support. A fake tech support guy stole almost $50,000 from a retiree who kept his bank account numbers and passwords in his computer. Chiam Hock Leong wanted to take a break from his computer to go for a walk with his wife when his computer crashed. But his computer suddenly went blank. A bunch of words started flashing across the screen and a voice came through the speakers telling him someone was trying to hack into his accounts and urged him to call Microsoft. If you're not too comfortable with technology, of course, this would scare the crap out of you. So Leong panic and called the number provided. A man named Sean, who had a heavy Indian accent, answered the call and explained that this was the reason people pay so much for the software. It told them when someone was hacking their computer. Sean said that he was there to help stop this person from stealing Leong's personal information. So Leong followed Sean's instructions, including entering his email, password, and turning off his cell phone so that the scammer would be unable to access it. The call lasted two to three hours. Sean and Leong talked for a while and shared personal details such as Leong's father being injured in the army and his family moving to the United States where they opened a convenience store. While he was on the phone, Leong's wife was cooking in the background. He wanted to hang up so he could eat, so Sean told him to leave his PC on overnight as the problem was too big to be solved over just a few hours. But Leong's gut told him to turn on his cell phone, even though Sean told him to keep it off. When he did, he got a list of notifications from his bank telling him about multiple transactions that had occurred while he was talking to Sean. Someone had siphoned tons of money from his account, so the retiree turned off his computer and contacted the bank. 
He filed a police report and froze his bank accounts. The police discovered that the money was transferred into the accounts of Anil Tripathi, who was arrested. Tripathi, who was a permanent resident in Singapore, said he thought a well-wisher had given him the money and redistributed it among his bank accounts, sending $10,000 to his home country of India. You know how that goes, right? All those anonymous well-wishers just sending you piles of cash constantly? It's a tale as old as time. The prosecution argued that if Tripathi thought someone had given him the money out of generosity, he should have at least verified the source of the transfers. Although prosecutors said there was no evidence connecting Tripathi to the scam, it should have been treated like finding a wallet on the ground and spending the money inside of it. Basically, if he was claiming he just kind of found the money, it still wasn't his money to spend. At the time that the transfers happened, Tripathi only had $50 in his two bank accounts. When prosecutors asked him why the funds entered his accounts, he claimed to have no idea. It's pretty hard to believe that he knew nothing when he immediately spent some of the money instead of reporting it to law enforcement. Tripathi also said he was willing to return the money to GM, although he would have to pay restitution on the $10,000 that he sent back to his family. If Tripathi is found guilty of dishonest misappropriation, he faces up to two years in jail and a hefty fine. It seems like if Tripathi wasn't Sean on the phone, he definitely knew who the scammer is and was playing dumb. Whenever you get unexpected emails, texts, or messages claiming something is wrong and to call all this number, never call it. If you need to verify your concerns, always get the number yourself. Number two, the classic third person. This story involves a Singaporean retiree who lost her life savings to a fake Facebook friend. A man named Alvin sent a woman, known as Madame Tan, a friend request on Facebook. According to his profile, Alvin was a Singaporean chief executive of an interior design firm in London and was in the process of completing a hotel, which would be his last project before retiring. After the two exchange messages, Alvin asked Tan to help him get his hands on some materials from companies in China. He was referred to a specific company but since he didn't speak Mandarin, he hoped she would act as an intermediary. Madame Tan was skeptical of Alvin until he transferred money into her account for the cost of the materials. He also showed her transfer statements from his British bank account, Barclays, which reassured her that she could trust him. Alvin had her make a list of transfers and sent her transfer statements to confirm the transactions. But the statements were fake. Madame Tan thought it would take a few days for Alvin's deposit into her account to clear. Then he told her she needed to keep making payments for additional fees like shipping and taxes. So she made 22 transfers of $20,000 each. Tan borrowed money from her son and took out a loan to make the final transaction of 50,000 bucks. Weeks after her first transfer, Madame Tan received a phone call from a Malaysian number that told her that Alvin had been detained at the airport for having too much cash on him. He needed her to pay $98,000 to release him from police custody. Her son was already suspicious of the transaction she was making, and before Madame Tan could approach her daughter for a loan, he intercepted and told her she was being scammed. Madame Tan attempted to confront the scammers, but they cut off all communication with her. She had three numbers for Alvin, two of which didn't answer the phone, and the third was a WhatsApp app account that was no longer linked to the app. Her children helped her file two police reports and write letters to the accounts that she sent the money to. In 15 days, Madame Tan lost $1 million that she likely won't be getting back. Although there are situations where someone needs help making transfers due to every country having different banking systems, the only people who should ever do this would be people you know personally and have known for a long time. You can never be too cautious when it comes to your finances. Number one, the online Line only friend. An unknown caller convinced an elderly woman known only as Emily to send them $10,000 through the mail. The caller spent weeks earning Emily's trust in what seems like a bit of a romance scam before convincing her to withdraw the money from her bank account and follow some pretty specific instructions. The caller had her go to the bank and withdraw the cash and to explain to the tellers that it was for her family. Then they had her stuff the bills into clothing items, tuck them into a box with random household objects on top and write happy birthday on the side of the box, which isn't suspicious at all. The caller insisted that she say that the gifts were for family when she dropped it off at the post office. Emily followed the instructions and separated $4,000 into two boxes, one that she sent to New York and the other to New Mexico. The caller pressed Emily for her visa card number as they wanted to withdraw an additional $5,000. Emily's close friend Wanda found out about the situation and rushed to Emily's home. Emily insisted that she needed to go to the bank 
to get the money, but Wanda wouldn't let her leave. She saw what was going on. So they called the local sheriff's department, who helped the two women lock Emily's visa card before any money could be withdrawn, and stop the two packages from reaching their destinations. Emily admitted that she was willing to take out a loan to help out the caller who wanted to travel to meet her. The police told her that if the caller did try to meet her in person, to immediately call 911. They also recommended that she ignore phone calls if she didn't recognize the number. Luckily, Emily got all of her money back thanks to Wanda's help. Sadly, many seniors don't have a Wanda watching their backs and making sure everything is okay. So please, help keep an eye on your elderly loved ones. Family or not, they deserve your protection, especially when it comes to shady financial transactions. Who are the people whose hearts are just black holes and all they care about is doing crime? Let's get right to it with... Number six. Get out, mom! A judge kicked 82-year-old Norma Gibbons out of her own London home after her relationship with her daughter, Dawn Gibbons, broke down. Norma had secretly given Dawn her $1.8 million home to avoid inheritance tax. The mother and daughter lived on the property, which was converted into first and second floor apartments, so it was a good idea and a good situation. However, tensions arose after the births of Dawn's daughter four years later. Their relationship completely fell apart one day when Dawn heard her mother screaming at her granddaughter. After that, things quickly escalated between mother and daughter. Norma called the police 155 times to make phony allegations against Dawn. The fraudulent calls became so excessive that social services actually told her to stop contacting them since it was clear nothing bad was going on. But Norma was not to be defeated so easily. Since she still lived upstairs, Norma started a campaign of harassment from her apartment. She constantly made loud noises and caused water leaks that dripped into Dawn's living area, which is a bit like cutting off your nose to spite your face, isn't it? The harassment got so bad that Dawn installed internal and external security cameras so she could document her mom's behavior. Norma also refused to let anyone fix the leaks, forcing Dawn and her child to live with water dripping from the ceiling. Dawn eventually obtained court orders to force her mother to allow handymen to come in, but Norma tore up the papers and threw them into the garden, apparently thinking that she somehow invalidated them. It was probably very dramatic too. The pair eventually entered a bitter legal battle. Dawn applied to have her mother thrown out and Norma told the court that Don tricked her into transferring the property. Norma's lawyer said she would never have transferred the property to Don if she thought her daughter would evict her, which seems like it could have gone without saying. But the judge wasn't going for it, since it obviously contradicted Norma's claim that Don tricked her into transferring the property to begin with. If Don didn't know about the transfer, how could she have tricked her mom into doing it? The judge ultimately concluded that Norma had gifted the apartment to her daughter without Don's knowledge and was innocent of any wrongdoing. The judge ruled ruled in Don's favor and finally evicted Norma. The judge also said that Norma had to pay 10,000 pounds to her daughter's legal fees, which Don said amounted to 28,000 pounds. It sounds pretty heartless to evict your own 82-year-old mother out of her house. Would you have done the same thing or try to find a more diplomatic way to resolve the issues? Let us know in the comments below. Number five, devastating soldiers. Army employee Kaz Craffy stole hundreds of thousands of dollars from the grief-stricken families of fallen soldiers. Craffy took control of their life insurance money through the brokerage firm where he worked, helping families who were receiving benefits of as much as $500,000. He leveraged his position as a civilian army employee to generate clients. Craffy then emptied the family's accounts through his own trades that earned him commissions of up to $4,500. So basically, he was taking their money and investing it for himself. One of his victims was Natasha Bavard, whose husband, Rodney C. Bavard, sadly lost his battle with depression in 2020. In the days that followed, the Army assigned Craffy as the widow's financial advisor to help her manage her late husband's life insurance funds. Natasha allowed Craffy to control over $370,000 so he could invest it conservatively, hoping the money would grow over time. Everything started out okay, but Craffy eventually started acting shady. In December 2021, Natasha had texted Craffy and asked how her account was doing. He said that the COVID Omicron variant took a chunk of her investment, which was believable, so no alarm bells were ringing. So she followed up in March of 22 to see if there was any improvement, and Craffy reassured her that things were looking a bit better, and most of the losses she had would be recovered as the market improved. But Natasha was still nervous since she'd already taken some pretty big losses, so a few days later, she reached out again to see if she should maybe withdraw some money or something. Not everyone is a whiz at the stock market, so it was understandable that she'd be stressing. The money was supposed to be set up for 
the children Natasha's husband left behind. McCraffy insisted that she didn't need to do anything because the market would bounce back. But then he went all Kanye and wrote a message in all caps telling her to not look at the accounts, which everyone on the internet knows that all caps means you're shouting. So Craffy was basically yelling at a scared widow to not look at her accounts, partially because it was probably freaking her out, but also probably because Craffy was being shady. But like, what do you do if you know next to nothing about trading? You listen to the guy the army assigned to help you. So Natasha followed his advice and lost over $200,000. Another victim was Sharon Hartz, who lost her son, Sergeant Thomas Anastasio, in January of 2019. The life insurance money helped them cope with the loss, since money helps with most things, and Hartz met Crafty a few days after her son's funeral to deal with the finances. The two quickly became close, to the point that Crafty even invited Hartz to his wedding. Unfortunately, Hartz didn't learn until much later that Crafty had also scammed her out of $200,000, because Kaz Crafty cares more about money than people. Eventually, during a financial regulatory investigation, the New Jersey brokerage firm fired him for misconduct since he was never supposed to have direct control over the accounts. The Non-Governmental Financial Industry Regulatory Authority also barred Craffy in December of 22 after he refused to cooperate in an investigation into his action. Then, in January of 23, Craffy left the Army after his behavior started an internal review of the Army's financial counselors to make sure they were following ethical and legal standards. An attorney representing nine other victims called for Congress and the Pentagon to implement safeguards to prevent this sort of thing from happening again. Our vets and their families deserve better. Number four, breaking the piggy bank. Olivia Ward, a worker at a maze, an after-hours childcare center on Australia's Gold Coast, scammed her community out of thousands of dollars. She pretended to have terminal cancer. Ward went as far as to shave her head and even had co-workers drive her to appointments. And can you imagine what those car rides were like? Co-workers not wanting to say anything unintentionally depressing. Ward going to some needless appointment, having to pretend she's sick, knowing she's wasting everyone's time. Those car rides must have taken forever. Community members, children at the school, and co-workers actually actually threw a fundraiser named Family Fun Day for Live in her honor. They charged a $5 entry fee for every family that came and offered multiple raffle tickets, which seriously, where are these communities? These people sound amazing, don't they? The children also did what they could to help their beloved teacher, with one student giving her a piggy bank to donate to the cause. You want to talk about having a black hole for a heart? She'd like some sweet little kid empty her piggy bank? She's like the Sheriff of Nottingham. For all you over 35, seriously, that was messed up wasn't it? What a great kid, though. Entertainer Chad Small hosted the fundraiser. Small had lost his sister to cancer three months before the event and wanted to help Ward in honor of his sibling. Because Chad Small is a good dude, and you can understand why this story would hit close to home. As the owner of the Magic Castle, a kid's entertainment company, not the place in LA where wizards go, Small had visited the school a few months before the fundraiser. The deranged Ward was wearing a headscarf and appeared visibly ill. Having dealt with his sister's cancer battle, Small spoke to her about the treatment she was receiving and the type of chemotherapy she was on. At the time of the fundraiser, Small believed Ward only had four months to live. Before his sister had passed away, she and her family raised money to support others facing terminal illnesses. So Small donated $2,500 of the $12,000 his family raised towards Ward's fundraiser in his sister's honor. As well as his donations, Small had to pay his employees to entertain the children at the fundraiser. In total, the event cost him $4,000, which was money he was happy to pay. But then, Small received a phone call from the police, who told him that everything Ward said was a lie. Olivia Ward defrauded a whole community full of good people out of $18,000. Authorities arrested and charged her with three counts of fraud and one count of forgery and uttering, which is basically forgery. We didn't know what uttering was either until we looked it up. She's an utterly terrible human though. Number three, the staged daycare. Couple Ali Farman and Lubna Hashimi, immigrants who fled from Iraq to Australia, ran an elaborate childcare subsidy fraud syndicate to claim government benefits. They called the daycare Red Roses Family Daycare Pty Limited, and from February 2018 to May 2019, they defrauded Australian taxpayers of almost $90,000. Farman and Hashimi claimed their business offered managed childcare services provided by qualified educators to private homes across the region. 
region, and the couple went to extreme measures to avoid getting caught. The pair set up suburban homes as fake daycares, furnished with items from stores like Kmart and Toys R Us, two stores that don't exist anymore, to make the houses look like legit classrooms. To fool government inspectors, they hung children's crafts and drawings on the walls and held pretend graduation ceremonies for students. It sounds like a plot from some lame 90s sitcom, doesn't it? The lovable cast of misfits having all sorts of near misses with the lame government inspector, obviously walking through the place. Hashimi had staff fill out their timesheet and subsidy submissions to the Department of Education and instructed them to sign off on fraudulent childcare claims. While Farman bought a one and a half million dollar townhouse and drove a Range Rover, he taught educators ways to prevent exposing their operation, especially during periods of intense government scrutiny. Some of Red Rose's workers, educators, and parents were complicit in the fraud, with educators paying parents to falsely claim their children were in Red Rose's care. The New South Wales Police Force formed Strike Force Mercury to investigate government welfare and insurance scams, which is a really intense name for welfare and insurance investigators, isn't it? Some Nick Fury style Aussie is like welfare fraud. Active Strike Force Mercury. Investigators from Strike Force Mercury performed surveillance of Red Rose's premises and monitored the 15 educators, ultimately exposing the fraud. In Australia, an educator can care for seven children at a time, including four below school age. During surveillance, the Strike Force learned that the phony daycare submitted false claims that an educator cared for children on 166 dates between October 2018 and May 2019. The educator claimed he looked after around seven children at once, despite never actually caring for children at that residence. Inspectors visited each educator's premises every month, during which time Farman and Hashimi sent children to those addresses. On one occasion, Farman ordered items from Officeworks, an office supply store, so that staff could make sure that the location looked like a real classroom. A Red Roses report from May 26, 2018 said that seven children were at the educator's home that day, and the report included a photograph of all the kids wearing a school uniform. The report would have been believable if May 26 that year wasn't on a Saturday. It sounds like one of those cliche cop movie tropes where the grizzled detective is like, you said you were getting the mail at the time the victim was attacked. Funny thing though, the victim was attacked on Sunday. There was no mail that day. Get him, boys. Red Roses even held a graduation ceremony in December 2018 and paraded children across the stage at a local youth center where Farman shook hands with all the educators. The couple was eventually arrested once their fraud was exposed. Farman pleaded guilty to aiding, abetting, and knowingly defrauding the government. Hashimi pleaded guilty to two counts of the same charge. Hashimi faced 15 years imprisonment and Farman faced 10. Before fleeing to Australia, the Iraqi couple lived in Iran. After the Gulf War, conditions for Iraqi expats in Iran deteriorated dramatically, prompting Farman to travel by boat to Australia in 1999. Hashimi joined him in 2006. They both apologized in court for deceiving the government and taxpayers of their adopted country. Although Judge Jane Culver agreed imprisonment was the only appropriate sentence for their crimes, she concluded that it didn't have to be performed in prison. It makes you wonder if she was wearing a clown outfit when she said this. Judge Culver concluded that imprisonment within the community would be as much punishment as custodial sentences. She ordered the couple to maintain good behavior for three years under the supervision of community corrections. The couple was like, oh no, please don't let us stay in our own home. Anything but that, please send us to prison instead. We can't take the indifferent looks of community members who aided us in our fraud. No. Number two, gold and silver. Former Tennessee lawmaker Larry Bates stole $21 million from 400 people in a Ponzi scheme. Bates, a former Democratic state representative, advertised his scheme on Christian radio and TV shows. The scam revolved around the buying and selling of gold and silver coins. Bates served in the Tennessee House from 1971 to 1976. In 2002, he formed First American Monetary Consultants, known as FAMC, based out of Colorado. It was through FAMC see that Bates had his scam Lee committed their fraud. Investors were enticed into spending over $87 million attempting to buy and invest in precious metals through FAMC. Seven years later, FAMC had over $26 million in unfulfilled orders. When customers asked where their coins were or for a refund, the people at FAMC gave excuses that there was an issue due to the coins being scarce and coming from Europe. They also blamed the unfulfilled orders on the U.S. mint shutdown. 
So between 2002 and 2013, 360 victims lost more than $21 million. Bates and his family kept most of the money for personal or promotional use. We're surprised too. Such as commodities, trading, and buying their 10,000 square foot home. They have to live, you know. They also spent $4 million to create the International Radio Network, a Christian radio network. The rest of the money went towards fulfilling prior unfulfilled orders. Bates, his two sons, and his daughter-in-law were arrested in May 2017 for mail and wire fraud. They faced charges of fraud, corruption, and embezzlement. The judge convicted Bates on 46 counts of the indictment. His son Chuck Bates on 18 counts of mail and wire fraud and one count of conspiracy. His other son, Robert Bates, was convicted on five counts of mail fraud three counts of wire fraud, and one count of conspiracy. Robert's wife, Kinsey Bates, was convicted on one count of conspiracy and two counts of wire fraud. We don't have to point out the irony in having a Christian radio network funded by stolen money, right? Number one, she knew it was over. Lorsine Lori Eisenberg was convicted for embezzling half a million dollars from the North Idaho Housing Coalition. The funds she embezzled were supposed to be used to help people find affordable housing. But it wasn't the only crime she committed. Her husband, Larry Eisenberg, passed away in 2018 after he fell overboard during a boating accident. Although Lori claimed it was an accidental drowning, his autopsy revealed a lethal dose of Benadryl in his system. The police didn't believe Lori's story and arrested her on suspicion of planning her husband's demise by loading him up with Benadryl and letting him drown. A normal amount of Benadryl in a person's system who's taking a prescribed dose is around 1,000 nanograms. Larry had over 7,100 nanograms in his system when he passed away, so it wasn't an accidental overdose. About a week after her husband's demise, Lori wrote a letter to family and friends where she detailed the events that led to the incident. She claimed that Larry was recovering from the flu when they took the boat out on the water to watch the sunrise. During their morning cruise, the motor stalled and Larry fell overboard when he leaned over the edge of the boat to check the motor. Lori also said that she attempted to grab him but tripped over a space heater and hit her head. According to Lori, she frantically searched for her husband but the only trace of him she found was his phone. She used his cell to call for help but told the detective she waited two hours to call because she didn't want to leave the area where he fell. But Larry's friends told a different story. He apparently texted them that morning to say he was feeling much better. Later in the day, he sent friends the thumb up emoji. Larry never used emojis in his messages, unlike his wife, who was all about them. Investigators discovered that someone had also made handwritten changes to Larry's will, giving 80% of his estate to Lori's six biological daughters and 20% to his own biological children. Sadly, Larry's biological son believed that Lori ended her husband's life to avoid him learning about her financial crimes. Days before investigators found Larry's body, Lori was arrested for stealing from the North Idaho Housing Coalition through wire fraud and federal program theft. In court, she said she stole the money to support her struggling children. However, prosecutors found that she was also searching for information on drownings in the days before the tragic event. Lori didn't deny researching drowning, but told the court that it wasn't for her husband. She said that she knew she only had two options when people learned of her embezzlement, spend the rest of her life in prison or end it. Lori's plan, she claimed, was to end her life to save her family from the humiliation of her crimes against the North Idaho Housing Coalition. So she mixed herself a cocktail containing a fatal dosage of the allergy medication, but her husband accidentally drank it. Lori added that she didn't remember all the details of the morning her husband fell overboard, but she recalled promising that she would join him eventually, but couldn't leave her family in such a mess. Lori's story didn't convince Judge Scott Wayman, who had reviewed all of the evidence and stated her version of the events didn't line up to the truth. We're pretty sure she didn't convince anyone. Having faced serious charges for Larry's passing, she pleaded guilty, and Judge Wayman sentenced her to 30 years to life in prison. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comment section what you think is more heartless, kicking your parents out of your inherited house they bought or stealing money from your parents.